Um, all right, uh, we won't make a start. Welcome everybody, thank you for joining us tonight. It's great to be um, kicking off the Friday night Zooms again. I've had a bit of a break because um, we have been expanding our family and one of the consequences of that is I get really sleepy about eight o'clock. But I'm in my radiant trimester. I don't know if it's just the humidity that's making me feel extra radiant. You're very glowing. Thank you, thank you. Um, but I thought it was a great chance for us to have a Zoom with some of our local parents to look at um, some of the schooling choices that um, Eco Village families have made because we do have access to a lot of great schools here on the Central Coast. And for a group of people with really aligned values, we've chosen a whole lot of different schools to send our kids to. And I find that fascinating. So we're gonna unpack that a bit more today. And uh, so on the call, we have some of our Eco Village members uh, with kids in the schooling system. Um, I'm homeschooling our kids and we've also got some other interested people that we've invited to join us. And usually we go live on Facebook as well, but we're not going to do that tonight. We're just going to keep it a bit smaller um, because we might be sharing stuff that's, you know, a bit more personal. Um, so I might actually get some of our families to introduce themselves to you tonight. Let's start with Deb and Dan because they're big on my screen. Um, guys, would you mind introducing yourself and your family and perhaps um, just briefly what school you've chosen? I think you're muted. Is that us or them? Oh, oh good one. Sorry. Trying again. Hi, my name's Deb Brown and uh, this is Sam. We've got two kids, uh, eight and six, Emily and Michael. Um, and we've chosen uh, the Montessori School, which is just over at Bateau Bay. It's about a 20, 25 minute drive from where we are. Yeah, mm -hmm. we've got two kids for now. Uh, Emily, she's eight and a half, and her little brother, and sometimes annoying little brother, depending on our best little brother. Uh, Michael, he's six and a half. Yeah. And I guess what, just in, briefly why we chose the school, we, um, we actually, before we moved to the Eco Village, already we live in the Eco Village now, but before that, or we lived in, in Sydney, um, and actually for a good school, a uh, friend of mine who herself uh, to Montessori School sort of got interested in that and looked at different schools there. So at this preschool level, or even now sort of the zero to three years level, um, we, they went to a, a Montessori inspired um, place. And that they're coming here, I can explain later a bit more, but that sort of just was a continuation uh, from that. Mm. Great. Thank you, guys. And who else have we got? Rani, do you want to introduce yourself and your family? All right, off unmute. Um, hi, my name's Rani. Um, I have three children. Um, Scout, who is 10, Matinka, who is 8, and August, who is 4. So the, um, both the girls are at the local state school, um, which is sort of a two-minute drive down the road. Um, it's close enough that kids can bike, and they've even started to walk to school, um, but mostly they catch the bus to school. Um, so it's very convenient. Um, we moved up to the Central Coast when my eldest started in kindergarten and became, we also at the same time became part of the Nara Eco Village community and um, it gave us two whole different worlds in which to settle into. So um, moving to the Central Coast was really easy because we had instant friends in multiple different directions. Um, so we've been very happy with the local state school and I'm aware that some people move into the local area in order to be zoned to have their children attend the school. So that's a very positive thing. Great. And Rani, you've also had a bit of experience with um, one of the local daycares too, haven't you, with all this? Yes, so um, two of my children have attended the local council-run childcare, um, which is adjoining the school, and they have a fabulous transition program for the children. So in their final years of attending long daycare or running the preschool program, they um, get to go across to the school and, and are part of a lot of the school events during the year. So whether it's sort of Easter hat parade, they're a part of that. Um, so they feel ready for school before they've even got there. It works really well. Cool. Thank you, Rani. Uh, let's see, we might talk to um, to the lovely uh, Steph sitting next to me. I feel like your co-host. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Steph actually is our neighbour pretty well, pretty much until a few more houses get built. Yeah, I'm, I'm a stone's throw, very, very long throw, but very close by. So I thought I'd toddle down. A slingshot. 
slingshot away. Oh, don't even start. It'll be a thing. Um, I have two children. My husband and I um, moved down from Newcastle. And so we've got two children. We've got Jasper, who is eight. It's a test, isn't it? It is. a tester. And Willow, who's four. So Jasper attends the Steiner School at Fountaindale. And he's been there since kindergarten. So we moved down from Newcastle prior to our house being built here at the Eco Village to get him started at um, in kindergarten at that school. And then Willow will be starting this this year in a couple of weeks' time at, in their early kindergarten program. And then that leads into kindergarten. Uh, she's also attended um, a local um, daycare centre as well at Arimba, the KU centre there. So we've had experience with that one as well. Great. Yeah. And let's see, a little bit later, we're going to be joined by another of our local families. Um, they're just in the middle of a dinner party with our next door neighbours. So <laughs> she did say she'll make a point to join us. <laughs> um, so let's just have a bit of a chat about um, why you chose your particular school. Uh, so Rani, let's start with you because you're big on my screen right now. What was your motivation for going with the local public school? And um, I guess how happy have you been with it? Hmm. Um, well, we've been extremely happy. Um, our children have thrived in the uh, the traditional state school system. Um, I guess at the early stages of moving to the Central Coast, I wasn't actually really aware of all the other options, um, although I did know that um, some people at the Eco Village that I'd met in those early days um, were considering doing things like homeschooling, and that wasn't really something that I wanted to do and um, my children just fit perfectly into the state school system. They thrive on that sort of academic um, component of it and I just always knew that it would be a really positive fit for them. So it was good for the children and it's also been very good for me because it means that I have a whole another group of friends of the parents and the community apart attached to that school apart from the Eco Village which has um, been really a positive thing in becoming part of the local general community as well as being very much embedded into the Nara Eco Village community which has been really special. Mm -hmm. And was the, um, the geographical proximity also a draw card for you? To the school? Um, well, I guess we just went with the local school in zone um, because I thought that would be the best way for the kids to meet other kids you know, locally. Um, it was just really positive for us to find out that it was actually um, a quite a sought after school um, where they're trying now very much to cap their numbers and only take in zone students. So um, it is a, a medium-sized school. I'm not very good on numbers. Um, but for example, there will be f three to four kindy classes each year. Cool. Thank you. Um, let's go to Deb and Dan. So guys, what was your motivation? I mean, Dan, you spoke a little bit about how you'd had contact with the, the Montessori system in Sydney uh, before you came up. But what was your motivation to, um, you know, enrol both the kids in Montessori for primary? Yeah, I have to watch what I say here because Emily, my daughter, just <laughs> reappeared from bed, <laughs> listening in. On after. But yeah, um, so what happened when they moved up here? They went to the preschool um, and as they were in the preschool, both of them, the primary school opened up because literally, um, um, you know, first kids came for the preschool, had thought about school options and then uh, after some discussions with um with parents and, and teachers, they opened up uh, this small uh, uh, primary school about three or four years ago now. Um, and I guess um, what um, for, for Emily, um, she's now in um, in the second cycle. So with Montessori, they're sort of in primary age. There's sort of two cycles. They have the six to nine year olds and then the nine to twelve year olds. She's so now in that that second cycle already and for her um, it was a very uh, sort of organic process you know speaking to uh, teachers who are at the preschool who also um, have connections or spend time at the at the school and um, around the type of learner that, that she is you know she likes to always as a little baby already she just looked at books and um, um, and yeah just um, sort of the, the, the kind of child that she is for her it was quite easy it was a bit harder for my son to make that decision. Um, so I think Emily led the way. She she really likes to um, have quiet spaces. Um, she 
uh, likes to have her own way. She's quite strong-willed. I don't know where she got that from. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, <laughs> she likes to, do, to work things out by herself uh, often. So for her, it was quite easy. And then with Michael, he's a bit more, um, I guess, experiential kind of learner. Um, so for him, again, um, when you look at the, um, at the sort of the, the ways that new topics are brought up in, in, in school, there's not sort of a frontal a teacher in front. Uh, for him, what really works well is these sort of, you might notice these Montessori pieces of work, like might be just a screw that the little kids undo and, and do up against so really learning these things. So he was a bit more of a hands-on and also a bit more energetic. And the school, um, just in the last couple of years, had an influx of, of a lot of little boys coming out of the preschool. So they adapted a bit and um, really bringing more of the, the physical activities. They have almost like a, a soccer team now there. Um, the director of the school, his name is Dimitri. Um, his, his kids at the time, they are now teenagers around 15, 16. Uh, his kids actually were first homeschooled at the primary school age. And then they went to um, the, low, the Central Coast Steiner School where Steph's kids go as well. And from that, he, he was very interested in bringing more of the arts and um, creative performing arts um, into the school where he sees Montessori can be sometimes a bit very much focused around these, um, these objects and these, these pieces of work that we sort of, sort of know. Um, and, but sometimes there can be things added, so like in the arts, in the the creative arts and the performing arts so they're bringing that more in um yeah um yeah i would just probably add that what one of the things i love about it is this the small community the school has a license for 60 kids um and i went to a small primary mm. and i thought that was small because it was 200 kids um so it's really quite um a, quite a beautiful little community and and as i think rani was reflecting on just having that you know, there's the community within the eco village, but there's also this really lovely community within the Montessori um, parents, and there's a lot of like-mindedness there as well. So I've just been really loving that. And one of the things I reflected on throughout my schooling was um, often sitting bored, waiting for the other 30 kids in the class to to learn whatever it is that the class needed to learn. And with the Montessori um, pedagogy, it's much more about meeting the child where they're at so extending them on um so if you know if they've already learned long division then they go up to the next thing they don't have to wait till next year when they're in the next class so that was one of the things that really stood out for me with in the decision for montessori cool thank you that that really resonates with me and i'm actually just sitting here thinking um about the diversity of the kids that we have here at the village you know we have ones that would thrive i think in any school situation um, you know, they know how to, dare I say, perform or, or they're quick to figure out what's what, what's asked of them. But um, we also have plenty of kids that learn in very different ways. And um, yeah, yeah, it's interesting, Deb. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, Steph, what about you? Why did you choose Steiner? Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> so one one of my interests in Steiner came through meeting several people ha who had gone through the Star a Steiner school and just seeing how well rounded they were as individuals. They were, you know, one one friend in particular. You know, she's she studied law. She's now studying medicine. She's she was a star ballerina. She's and she's the nicest person you will ever meet. And then I met someone else who was beautiful and well-rounded and then someone else. And then I met some teenagers who went to Steiner to, through the Steiner education and they seemed unusually comfortable in their own skin for a teenager and unusually comfortable being around adults. And um, there was just a certain presence and a sense of self that I could see in many students who were going through or adults who had gone through the Steiner way of learning. And I wanted that for my own kids as someone who I think ended up coming out through school and did exceedingly well through the public system. 
I knew how to learn, I knew how to study, but I had no idea who I was. Mm -hmm. And so I really wanted for my children to have a strong sense of knowing who they were and having a sense of purpose. Um, and I felt that that was, um, and investigating Steiner, I felt that that was something a little more focused upon in the, the way they, they teach students. It's, it's, things are purposeful. And, um, and it is quite focused on the individual as well as the group. And it focuses on a lot of different areas. So it's not just purely academic, it's quite artistic as well, which for my son Jasper, he, he's got a very clever mind, but he was never interested in the arts or drawing because he was too busy playing outside, but also because he had a very um, self-critical nature. He's very anxious and has a very self-critical nature. And so just wouldn't do it, could he, so he could never do it right. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Steiner method, he's now, he, in kindergarten, they just spent hours drawing as a preparation for writing, but it was just purely drawing and it was something that they would sit down and do together. And so he did it. And now he's learned to love drawing. He really enjoys drawing and he's very good at it. And he's also attending and um, doing class plays. And that's something he would never do previously in, in his preschool, you know, any kind of group situation where they would be up in front of a class and in a group, he, he would be cowering on my lap, like, don't ever let me, don't ever make me do that. So there's something about the group, the way they do things as a group in the Steiner method that suits my son really well. And um, it's interesting because Ronnie, Ronnie talking about the Niagara Park School, that it was, it's quite a popular school in terms of people wanting to move into the area. That's what we've come from, from Newcastle. So that was our choice for Jasper and Newcastle. We were zoned for one of the best most sought after public schools in Newcastle. And yet we felt for Jasper that that wasn't going to be a good fit because it was too big and he's quite a sensitive soul. And he's also a very fidgety boy. And um, I think he'd struggle in a, in a typical classroom. Whereas there, his teacher, because they spend their whole primary schooling from year one to six with the same teacher, they develop a really deep relationship, a really strong bond with that teacher. And that suits him really well because he doesn't transition and change all that well. But she also knows that about him and has developed a lot of strategies to try and encourage him to be able to be still at a desk when he needs to. Um, but seeing that there's times where learning can be very physical in the Steiner method as well. Learning um, numbers and counting and times tables is often done in a circle clapping to a rhythm or passing a stick around or playing with bean bags. So for a child who can't sit still in a classroom, that's a brilliant way to actually kind of get it in, not only on an intellectual level, but on a body sense, physical kinesthetic way as well. So that would suit him. I think Willow will just work wherever she is. So I'm not too worried about her. She's going to, she's going to kill it at the school, but she would anywhere. But for, for Jasper, that was my main concern was trying to find a school that would fit him. Right. It sounds like it's working really well for him. I think so. He still says it's boring and he hates it, but he just doesn't know how good he's got it. You see, I find that so reassuring when parents tell me how much their kids hate their school because <laughs> uh, because we homeschool, I do sometimes receive that feedback myself that um, my teacher sucks and things like that. Um, and, you know, it's, it's just nice to hear that it's not just me. Um, I should say too, it's interesting because of some of the families that we have represented, you know, we've got the, the public school where, Rani, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, you would rotate through and have a different teacher most years. Is that right? Um, yes, they do. Um, but the way the school often works in the sort of the, um, was it like stage two and three, a lot of their classes are actually composite classes. So they'll have a mix of two year groups. And so there will be... I don't know, instead of four, there might be five or six teachers of that stage. And they rotate for their maths groups. They rotate for their spelling groups. Um, and they'll have different teachers that might work with them for library or different teachers with computers. Um, they'll rotate for different teachers who want to do the arts versus teachers who want to do theatre. Um, and so by the time they get to their final year of primary school, um, the kids at the school have actually dealt with lots of different teachers 
and um, have really, I guess, um, benefited from the different teachers and the different teaching methods. Um, the teachers at the school are beautiful and, you know, my children cry at the end of the year because they're so sad. <laughs> um, and even though they know the teacher will just be you know, in the room near them, um, they, they have um, really connected with each teacher that they've had every year without fail. Um, so it has been a, a really um, delightful thing for them. You know, um, I, I totally admire people that can homeschool, um, but it's not something <laughs> I, I could do. Um, and so, you know, you really are putting out your child there in the trust of someone else to, to, to develop a lot of those um, skills, not just the academic ones, but sort of, I guess, the social and emotional ones. And um, it has been a very positive experience for us um, that they have been um, there for our kids, you know, and, and very open and very accessible and, and, and really um, make it a, an active process in, in helping resolve um, any situations that you might have with the child, you know, if you're, you're dealing with a little bit of, you know, friendship issues or whether it's... Um, feeling a bit like they're falling a bit behind. We're not a very sporty family. Um, so, so, you know, sometimes that can be a bit of a, a sensitive topic, um, you know, and, and so having a school that has been very approachable and that's, that includes sort of, I guess, the, the deputies and very much so the principal um, with an open door policy to talk about things makes me feel like I'm not just sending them out the door and have no connection with what they do. And that's really important. Yeah. Uh, Rani, do you know how long your principal's been there for? Ooh, seven years, I think. Oh. And it's it's neat. Um, I think I know what you're talking about. How they do the um, the whole grade kind of teaching for certain subjects, in that and that enables them to then kind of scaffold um, or, or group children of like ability, so that we're not being like poor Deb stuck in the classroom, being you know waiting for the rest of them to catch up. Um, yeah, they work very much on the fact that um, you know any school following the syllabus is a, is a continuum and each year group will sort of overlap as, as you go through the years. And that just means that they're not making kids sit where they are via their age. They're allowing them to shuffle between those two year groups academically. So you can have students who are actually learning maths or English in a, a category that could even be up to two years older than their actual classmates, which yet yeah, gets around that problem of, of kids being sort of hamstrung back with what's going on in the classroom. Yeah, and that's one of the things that um, I find attractive about Montessori um, style of schooling is that, um, Dan, you can probably speak more about this, but actually, Dan, do you want to, do you want to talk about like the multi-age groupings and how that allows for children to kind of not be held back? Sure, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yes, I, you know, I say that's this sort of basic in a primary school, there are just these two uh, rooms um, or spaces, as, as they call it. There are six to uh, nine year olds and then nine to 12 year olds. And it's six to nine year olds, they always talk a lot, a lot about around sort of freedom within, within limits. So there, you know, um, there are really, there are a few very clear things that the kids learn. And it was interesting because Michael just started schooling. So at that school, they have a rolling start. So some kids start at the beginning of the year, like now when they, uh, in the year that they turn six, or in his case, he was turning six in April. So he started in March and it was just before the COVID outbreak. So it was really interesting. We did homeschooling for a couple of months, or not a couple of months, I think three, four weeks, can't remember. It felt like a couple of months. <laughs> and Emily, she really had this, um, rhythm they often talk about is this rhythm um, and she really had this rhythm and Michael didn't have it yet because we literally started homeschooling <laughs> sorry and trying to but there's a lot of at like nine o'clock there's this work cycle for a, for a, for a, uh, three hours and um, they're really like sitting around tables kids of different age groups um, is that like six nine year olds say and there's then this thing going on where um, they might explore a project which is an animal and one kid knows already how to write so they might do the writing. Uh, younger kids they might be more um, looking at uh, looking at a book, interesting um, things, interesting picture that they like, they might draw the picture. Um, so this, there's this inter-age uh, working is all centers around a, a small uh, table where three, four kids sit 
uh, next to each other. And the teachers are really, I mean, as a lot of, and a lot of the teachers actually come out of uh, Sydney, some of the Montessori schools there, the one in Balmain or, or in, in the Eastern suburbs. They're really just, they're not, um, they're, they're just floating in the classroom and they're just observing what the kids are doing. And if they ever get stuck, they ask some little questions. So it's a very subtle kind of teaching method as well. It's really around often these kids sitting around the table. Um, there is also increasingly um, uh, a connection between the preschool. So one day a week now, they're having reading buddies, what they call. So a kid like, like Emily, she's eight years now, she goes um, to the preschool and she reads to her um, uh, four, four or five year old over there, reads books that, that the child likes to learn. They're quite strong on um, and really trying this around the, the clear rules to instill empathy and, and caring for each other and how we talk to each other. Um, you, you know, whenever they're, and I said they're in, in the younger age, there are quite a few boys. When it, whenever it gets a bit boisterous, there are some, some times where it's just a circle and they just talk about what just happened and, and how different people felt and, and express that. So there's also yeah, quite a gentle way of um, um, looking at, at conflict sort of in the classrooms as well. Um, yeah, so, um, and as Deborah said, it's a small school, you know, it's, uh, I think I remember like 50 to 55 children. So yeah, it's, um, it's yeah, it's, it's quite personal. <laughs> the, the bonds that the children then, then form all the time. Um, yeah, anything else you wanna? Thanks, Dan. Um, Steph, do you want to, you mentioned before that um, your son's going to have the same teacher all the way through from, did you say year one to year six? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, does he have exposure to any other teachers in that time? Yeah, definitely. So he does have um, his pro main teacher and in most classes they also have an assistant teacher which who stays with them, um, which is lovely. So a group of say 28 students, they will generally have two teachers with them at any given time. Um, but they do have a German teacher who comes in, they do sports with another teacher, they've got, um, they, they change up what they're doing, but I think there's times where they go off with the groundskeeper and do, you know, gardening and mulching and things like that. So while they do have their main teacher, they are exposed to quite a number of the teachers through the school for, for a variety of different activities. Um, they've got a librarian there that becomes quite a popular feature in their lives from year three. And then they've got um, a fabulous art teacher there at that school as well. So that they encounter further, further along in their studies. So yeah, they, they definitely get exposure to a number of, of different teaching mm. styles and teachers. And in terms of the age range in Justice class, is it a similar thing to like Montessori or um, what Rani is saying about the composite class with exposure to much older or younger kids? Or Not they... necessarily. It's probably um, with it, within any class because of the, the types of families that send their children to Steiner, often you'll find that they're the age ranges tend to be a little bit older in each class compared to say a public school, I would say, because a lot of families choose to hold their, their children back as long as they are legally allowed to. So there's quite a, a number of older kids in his class, but um, uh, it tends to just be their class year, but it can, it can range through a full 12 months and even a little stretch beyond with the summer holidays as well. Um, but no, they don't tend to have composite classes um, in the same way as they would at, at certainly not the Montessori style and um, it sounds like even more so at the public school they might meld or blend. Um, I think the, the focus for uh, that individualized learning is the teacher and the assistant teachers get to know each child quite well and so they on an individual basis can extend them. So for example, Jasper's very strong in mathematics so his teacher is always looking out for that point where he's done that bit of work and is sitting there waiting for everyone else to catch up, she gives them the next thing. She's already ready with that next thing for him and the next thing. And she knows that there's certain areas where he's not ready to be stretched, but she said, oh, I'll get him next year. You know, <laughs> like he'll push back now, but I'll get him next year. <laughs> he'll be ready then. So yeah. That sounds great. Yeah. So it's a different approach. Um, Oh, this is a good question about um, Montessori and 
worksheets. So Dan, you spoke about how the kids sit around in groups and write projects about animals. Do you do any kind of book work? Yeah, yeah. The, the short answer is yes. And uh, <laughs> Deborah just was typing up an answer actually. Do you oh. wanna So it's explain? an interesting question because worksheets themselves, no, they wouldn't they wouldn't work from an exercise book like that, but they do they often make their own books. So even from the preschool, the yeah, at least six, I think in preschool as well, they get the, the needle and thread and they actually sew their own books and they make books either with plain paper or lined paper. And they use them for all sorts of subjects and obviously slightly different books for different subjects. So the handwriting, the teachers will have um, little cards that they look at and they copy for handwriting, but they don't have a, a textbook as such or um, and but they have lots of books in, in terms of a reference library so they'll just go to a shelf and they'll find that dinosaur book that they really love and the teachers uh, kind of really love to use whatever they're interested in to then bring it back to okay we want you to practice handwriting but sure you can copy that text about the dinosaurs because you love dinosaurs so much and that can be your handwriting for example so they yeah they use exercise books but it's really about recording what their work is at the time. And so they'll have a project book, they have a drawing book, they have a handwriting book, they have a maths book. Um, but none of them are actual textbooks. They're all just essentially blank books mm. that they often, yeah, sew together themselves and create the covers and whatnot. Because there's actually no boards in the Montessori classrooms. Um, all of the work that the teacher does with the children is in presentations and they normally would have up to maybe eight kids in a presentation. So they always segregate the class and they take kids at a certain time so that they can keep a handle on everybody who's in that presentation. Sometimes it's even fewer than eight. Um, and so they don't keep that a blackboard or a whiteboard. It's, the culture is set up already in the preschool. Um, it's really so hard to explain, but so it's so, so beneficial to just observe. And that's what they encourage everybody to do if you're interested. You can go and you can just actually watch. And what happens in the preschool already is, um, you know, you, you can imagine all these three to six year olds running about, having a lot, making lots of noise. But in, in a Montessori preschool, they're, they're commonly very quiet because um, they're all encouraged to just find what they want to do. They get it off the shelf, they put their mat out, they do what they want to do, they finish it, they put it back, they roll the mat up and they put it away. And then they go to the next next activity. So they don't really need the teacher until, and so well, that's already set up in a preschool environment, if you like, but they don't really feel the need for a teacher um, constantly. It's only when they get stuck. And so the teachers are there floating around, seeing who is stuck. And sometimes stuck behavior looks like them starting to distract others because they don't know what they're doing or, or just, you know, you're starting to leave what they know to do. So it is definitely encouraging self-direction um, from a very early age. I find that quite interesting, Deb, because um, we are homeschooling our kids. I've got uh, Theo, who is almost eight, and Hugo, who is five and a half, and technical be, technically will be starting kindy this year. Um, and that's something that we've worked really hard on. We are Montessori inspired, and so for me, one of the biggest draw cards of that is about developing the child's concentration and their ability to choose their own work. And so, um, not so much for Hugo, because he's still a bit little, but Theo has, uh, we come up with a work plan each Monday where we say, this is what um, this is what the syllabus says that you need to cover. So here are some things that you can do this week. And what would you like to do this week? And so for the last two years, Theo has wanted to explore uh, weapons from ancient times. And so we have written about weapons and we've done maths activities about weapons and we've made weapons. Um, he's been really fascinated by that. Um, but it does mean that, and this works better some days than others, I imagine in the classroom with a trained teacher it works better, um, but it does mean that come Monday or Tuesday morning we start, we finish our breakfast and we say well let's do some work, go and choose something off your work card, Hugo go and choose something off the shelf and they just kind of do it. And then when they've finished doing that, like Theo might have decided that he's written enough about his weapons to show Jasper, um, they'll just go on to something else. And it's, it's, Natalie, it's one of those things that the teacher doesn't look like they're doing a whole lot in terms of presenting, but actually it's all, as Deb says, it's, it's part of the culture. 
and the children learn how to behave, I guess. Um, yeah, so we're still working on that. I mean, traditionally, um, Montessori schools have what they call a three-hour work cycle, where the children feel, uh, will do just that, as I've explained, for a three-hour period. They will go off and choose their work and work on it. It could be by themselves or it could be with other people. Um, and then they'll have, you know, a break or whatever. We tend to include snacks in our three-hour work cycle. <laughs> and it's not just because I'm pregnant. Um, <laughs> but it really is interesting in terms of developing independent learners, I guess. Um, I need to flick to... Oh, there's all these questions. All right. Whew. All right, hang on. Does Steiner have a preschool? Yes, it does. Um, so it has an early, they call it early kindergarten. So this is what, so it's only for one year prior to kindergarten that they have it open. However, there is an associated play group that you can attend prior to that. So there's a play group that feeds into early kindergarten, which is one year of three days a week. So that's what Willow will be going to this coming year, as well as uh, Beatrix and Meadow and Axel. So three of the children from the eco village will be in her class. Um, I should say that there's at least three other children from the Eco Village in Jasper's class as well. <laughs> We're kind of taking over. <laughs> um, but, but there is a plenty, of, there's a beautiful community, I should say, that is not just Eco Village families, although there's a number of us there, but there's a wonderful community um, at the Steiner School. It's really quite impressive. And if you ever have a chance to go to the Steiner School Spring Fair, it's epic. So, um, preschool. Yes, three days a week. Um, and unfortunately, one of the things about the Steiner School is that there is only one class group in each age, each class group, there's only one. And so for families considering it, get your foot in the door now, get your name on the list now, get your child into the play group and then the, the preschool. Once you've got one child in, you've got that pr family priority. Um, but I know, there are, I am aware there's a couple of people that I know that have tried to get their children into the early kindy program and have missed out at this point, but then they're still hopeful for kindergarten. So, um, yes. Mm. Good tips. Yeah. And um, Dan, can you just explain a bit more about the preschool that's attached to the Montessori, where your kids go? Yeah, um, so it actually starts from, they have a, uh, for, for, for I started at zero now with uh, just recently they started like I think from, from zero to two a very a very early uh, uh, kind of Montessori uh, because Montessori is really I think we started was really about the preschool you know it's some people ask will there ever be a Montessori high school I understand elsewhere there is that uh, but it's really this very early it's sort of at the core of where it came from right um, and I'm um, and um, so there is the, the zero to two, and then it's the sort of the two to um, to five preschool, uh, sorry, three to five um, uh, preschool, and and yeah, so those two are in the same place. It's a rural property, uh, former formal uh, house, a bigger house that they converted into that. That's in Vomboro on the central coast, and then just up the road from there, that's where the um, that's better than from the, 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 the school then is. But the preschool is, um, they, um, they're starting off, we started off with really going one evening to information evening uh, to meet, um, to hear about the school. And they encourage to, um, to start really with maybe a couple of days a week. Um, that's, that's how we went a couple of days a week, then to three days. And eventually, as it got closer to school, a five-year-old um, up to up to five days. It's it's not you know compulsory, but it's sort of the sort of the, the general to, you know, transition how the people um, build up. And the teachers are again they're they're moving between uh, some just different roles. They they do uh, have done preschool work, led the preschool, then help uh, in, in the primary school from the education background. Uh, they sort of. Uh, qualified to the primary school and then there's also this back and forth with the for example if the reading buddies where teachers with um, uh, children from the primary school go into the preschool do the activities with kids there um, so it's a quite a you know quite an open uh, back and forth between the, the preschool and the school um, and yeah and just encourage you know if you have any questions any more about uh, enrolling and like you said Steph around places there I'm happy to you know take any questions or if you want to share my contact details or Deborah's contact details as well 
I just realized that even with Stein, I come from a really uh, background in Germany. If two of my aunties went to a Steiner school. I feel like in the Central Coast, we're really, especially with Montessori as well. You know, there are nowadays there are a lot of sort of Montessori academies. And I feel like we have really quite strong schools in the sort of, you know, whether you go with Steiner or even homeschooling uh, community so big on the Central Coast, right, Vanessa? So that's, you know, obviously the public school at Nyaka Park, really good public. I feel like whatever you want to go and whatever philosophy you think is good for your kid, they're really good and authentic kind of schools for that. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. Yeah. Because I mean, the um, with the homeschoolers, the Central Coast homeschoolers is, is the um, the largest group in New South Wales. Apparently, there's more people oh, really? here that homeschool than any other region. Yeah, I know that. Um, for example, in Newcastle, the the local Steiner school, um, it's a little ways out of town. There's a, a fabulous one out of East Maitland, but the one in Newcastle itself. Hmm. And I, I, it's, it, it's a bit ambiguous and I wouldn't have actually chosen it for Jasper, whereas the Central Coast Dinosaur School, we showed up there and went, yes, mm -hmm. this is great. And we investigated Montessori as well, because I think that would have been a really great fit for Jasper as well. Um, where we sat with that was that because we were dragging Jasper into a new place, new eco village, new house build, and because the Montessori school was still, the, the primary school was still getting established at this point, knowing that Jasper needed some kind of stability for him, we felt that the Steiner school was, was better suited for that reason, but we also very strongly um, liked the principles of Montessori mm. and that self-directed learning because I took him to a, a Montessori play group in Newcastle for a number of years and they didn't actually have a primary school there until recently, but they do now. So it is, it is interesting to note that, you know, not all schools are necessarily the same, but the ones that we have locally are just really strong, fantastic yeah. schools. And if I can throw our two cents in as well, if we decided to um, pull the pin on the homeschooling, we would probably start with the local public school. John and I both were um, educated in the public system. We know it pretty well. And I'm a high school teacher in, um, in the public system. And... Um, I'm really, really impressed by how community focused Niagara Park Primary is. They have, they, like for me, this is the, the marker of how community focused a, a school is. They host, um, or they used to host, correct me if I'm wrong, Riley, but they used to host the community Christmas carols. And it's like, that was the school you went to for your Christmas carols. Um, and I really appreciate that, <laughs> you know. Um, I'm, I've got some questions too. We will get to high school and I, I want to flick over to Sarah in a minute because Sarah's had an extensive um, educational experience with uh, lots of different schools. But the sports I know mm. I'm going to go to Lorraine as well. There's so much to talk about. <laughs> two big things, two big, um, not bugbears, but hot topics. Uh, can I get two minutes from each of you about what your school does for homework and technology? So Rani, we'll start with you because I know that Niagara Park is a... Um, a school leader with the tech stuff? Uh, they are very big into the technology. Um, they have a lot of um, robots. They have whole class sets. They have whole class sets of um, computers and iPads. Um, they do a lot of coding. It's a really big part of um, what the kids are. And um, what was the other, it was technology and what was the other part? Technology and homework. Oh, homework, yes. So the school, philosophy on homework is that they have homework it works in a for the older year groups they have homework and it's a um a, a grid system where the child gets to choose three of those activities across the term and some of them will be very artistic based like um reproduce a piece of of artwork in the style of something or they might have to write uh, a, a written piece or they can build something or they need to do maths problems so they really get to choose what they want and the whole idea I think behind it is simply to encourage children to enjoy the process it's not actually about doing things to tick it off it's about doing the different tasks and I guess leading towards uh, home study much later on and if the children choose not to do it there is no pressure from the school if the parents choose not to do it there is no pressure from the school and if the children do do it then they get the feedback and reward from the teachers but the people who do and don't uh, are not compared there's no you know chart of who has or hasn't done it it's it's very much about the individual household um so 
um, I think that's a really positive system. It's there for the people who want it. And if you don't want any of it, you know, you just simply don't have to worry about it. Is there anything though that is um, highly recommended? Like do they send readers home or anything like that? Uh, from kindergarten, they have a, a, a very strong reading program. Um, as a kindy parent, usually you're invited to come in and, and sort of help out, which is really interesting to observe what's going on. Um, very early on, the teacher has a, a really clear system of, of the students and if you told me that you could get a whole bunch of kindy kids and work with two or three students with the teacher and the rest of them were spending two hours free roaming the classroom teaching themselves, I would have said that you were mad. Um, but I've seen it in action and they just basically have must-dos and can-dos and they are all play-based activities. So um, these teachers just must spend hours making games specifically for the sets of words or um, mathematical things that they need to be doing at the time. And the kids just think that they're playing, you know, fishing games, but in fact they're having to collect words in certain groups or um, doing things that they don't realise is learning, but it's this constant um, wave of, of, of language and, and words and numbers. Meanwhile, the teacher's sitting over in the corner working with just two or three students, working one-on-one -on -one with them, with their spelling or one-on-one -on -one with their maths in those early years. Um, so it's, it's very, um, I guess, concentrated learning with each student in those periods of time. And the kids just love the whole concept of being able to choose the things that they want to do. And um, it's really wonderful as a parent to go into the classroom and, and just be able to help and, and observe and you learn yourself. So I think I've learned more things about grammar and spelling from being at the school with my children than I did when I was at school. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's really incredible, explicit teaching about those things and they're just blooming, you know, it's, um, the reading level is quite amazing at the school. And they also have a really big program for reading of any student that is falling behind. They have, uh, I think there's almost like one permanent teacher in the school who works one-on-one -on -one with students all year working on the reading recovery programs. Mm. So that's a, sort of a backbone of, 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 of their schooling is once you've taught them to read, then they have access to any information that they want in any form of media to, to teach and learn about things themselves. Great, thanks Rani. Um, Deb and Dan, technology and homework at your school, what does that look like? Um, I'm super happy to have no homework. <laughs> um, and technology in the, the, in the preschool is none in, in the, um, the class, which is for the six to nines, there is none. In the nine to 12 class, they introduce technology um, and they have... Um, access maybe once a week possibly to a shared class computer. Um, Emily excitedly also let me know that they have access to a shared sewing machine and all sorts of other things which is I guess sort of technology. Um, but yeah the, the technology use is very low in the Montessori. Um, it's not completely left out, it's just delayed and um, recently, um, the kids all were invited to, all of the, the older class were invited to once a week. Um, they had a turn of cooking, so they cooked for the whole class. Emily did a pasta bake. And part of that was not just the cooking, but typing up the recipe. And also, you know, a lot of them spent ages doing pretty formatting around it. So it wasn't just typing. So that's how they introduced some of the, the technology, um, as well as sometimes research. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And Steph, what about at the Steiner School? Talk us through what homework and technology use looks like there. So there's very little homework until the high school years other than um, if a student needs to finish some work that they didn't get to in class because they, for whatever reason, um, then they might come home and I mean, Jasper's come home with knitting. Um, I know other children are sent home with readers if they need to, to um, spend a little bit more time on their reading. So, but most of the time there is, there is no homework or there might be a little project like across the weekend you could go outside at different times of day and stand in the sun and see what happens to your shadow. So it's a very experiential little project. So uh, very minimal in terms of homework, almost none. 
Uh, and in terms of technology, there is no technology in the classrooms until high school. So the philosophy is they would like the children to master themselves prior to then um, taking on technology. Um, but then it is very much used in the high school years. Mm. And there is a high school program at the Steiner School from year seven to, till 10. And then usually they will find a more specialized high school for their interests for year 11 and 12. Yeah, great, yeah. thank you. And I should point out too that at the Eco Village here, um, parents have quite a, a wide um, a wide range of views about technology and the types of um, tech access that their kids have. So we have some who have nothing and we have some who have it um, at, you know, at on demand basically in terms of uh, TVs and computer games and stuff like that. Um, and I think we're finding a way to make that work here without it becoming too much of an issue between um, the families. And I think a lot of that comes down to just communicating about what each family's expectation is. And it's quite common for kids to say, oh, you know, I can't go over because so-and-so is doing their screen time or <laughs> I'm not allowed to do screen time, so I'm going to go now. Um, they're quite good at knowing their boundaries. I, I don't know, it might change as they get older. Um, but speaking of older, let's throw to Steph, uh, not to Steph, sorry, to Sarah because Sarah's um, had experience with a few different schools, particularly, Sarah, do you mind focusing on uh, your high school experiences? Yeah, sure. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah. Um, and this is Paul. Hi everyone. Um, I'm, yeah, I joined you guys tonight because I am super excited. We're pregnant. Yay. Um, and I, yeah, so I'm, like we're tossing up in between you know um steiner and montessori, steiner and montessori yeah. yeah but anyway um i've got jacob who's 15 still in the high school system and i had ethan who has now finished year 12 um he's 19 and we've been to so many different schools on the coast so um do you want to sarah do you want to just kind of introduce your kids um as learners perhaps to frame where you're going to go yeah sure 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 um ethan and jacob are just so different you know as learners and as individuals um i think ethan you know primarily you know ha has not been neurotypical um he's not ever really kind of fit into any kind of school box um and i think that that is why he's been to so many different schools so you know we've had behavioral issues and learning issues um and attention deficit disorder and just just a lot of um a lot of different dynamics and bullying and all sorts of stuff um you know at various schools so ethan has been to about six different schools um ethan started off at the coast christian school which is a little community school over at bensville um and from you know from our area from narara they have a bus that kind of goes over there and it's a really small it's lovely it's a really beautiful school um but they didn't have a high school so he kind of went from that small tiny school which was really nurturing and really quite beautiful to um a bigger school which really didn't work for him um he went to greenpoint christian school initially um it, that was quite large for him but still you know a nice school over at greenpoint um ethan also went to saint phillips at narara so that's a nice close one to our village and they've got some really awesome programs you know they've got a specific kind of school called dale um you know which is for kids uh with disabilities it's, it's, a, it's a really beautiful environment um so we liked we liked the community at st phillips that was nice he was there for about a year uh ethan briefly went to steiner in high school um and i loved it i totally loved it ethan hated it um unfortunately and i think that that's probably because he spent his whole life at mainstream school um and then just kind of yeah he really he just didn't fit in that well but i think had i put ethan in there you know from kindergarten that would have been the best school for him developmentally i just think it would have fit so well um ethan went to narara valley high so ethan did year 10 at narara valley high um and that was um 
They've got a really good agricultural program um, and they've also got really good, you know, supports in terms of counsellors and that kind of thing. So, you know, we were pretty happy with Narara Valley and it was our first experience of going to a public high school as well. So it was like, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't anything um, like I had sort of preconceived. So I think that they've got, you know, some really great programs there also in relation to uh, performing arts. Um, and as some of you know, it's just on our street, which is really quite handy. Um, Ethan then went overseas and did a rotary exchange for a year. Um, and he did, um, he went to Belgium and did year 11. Um, and when he got back, he went to Terrigal High. Even though we were out of the zone, we managed to get him in there. So he finished year 12 at Terrigal High. So yeah, so many different schools for him. Um, we were just so happy that he stayed in school and finished and um you know it was a it was a different kind of experience to you know what Jacob is going through now where he's just kind of Jacob fits in really well um I haven't had any you know significant learning issues with Jacob or behavioral issues with Jacob and you know wherever I've kind of sent him he fits and Jacob has been to Our Lady of the Rosary which was at Wyoming um, which is a nice small little Catholic school um, and it worked you know well for our family at the time um, and then he's now at St Edward's College at East Gosford and you know he's thriving there he's going into year nine um, and yeah it's, it's nice in relation to the fact that it's just a boys school because I think that Jacob could probably be quite distracted um, you know, by girls at this stage, he is very distracted by girls. So they also do integrate, you know, pretty well with St. Joseph's next door. Um, you know, they have like lunchtime on the Oval and all that kind of stuff. And they catch the bus and all that jazz together and they hang out with the girls from next door. But, you know, like in the classroom, I think, it, you know, it really does help to have that all boys kind of perspective. Um, and they've got a whole heap of different programs and really beautiful, beautiful things. So... Yeah, we like St. Eddie's um, for Jacob anyway. It's been, it's been really handy. Um, so, yeah, um, that's us. Happy to answer any questions about high schools. I feel like we could um, do our next Zoom just with you, Sarah. There's a lot <laughs> of back. <laughs> I know that um, the Rara Valley High, which is our local one, um, our local public high school, we have a, a really good relationship with them. Um, we used to host our Eco, Eco Burbia festivals there. And I know that a couple of our community members have gone and done kind of mentoring stuff with some of the kids. And I've also heard, um, correct me if I'm wrong, that they have, if you are pregnant and still trying to finish school, you will often transfer to Narara Valley High and they've got a special support class there. Um, so yeah, they also, they also have that same kind of support class at St. Philip's Christian College as well, so in Narara. So we're so lucky to have, you know, one public high school that has that kind of support and also one private, like it's, it's brilliant. It is brilliant. It also makes me wonder, Sarah, what the heck is up with the River Valley? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Something in the water. <laughs> um, I, I'd like to hear from Lorraine too. I'm aware that we're three minutes over time. So if you do have to cut and run, I appreciate you coming. Um, Lorraine, do you want to talk a bit about the schools, the local schools that you've had experience with? Ah, yeah, sure. So I've, um, my, my kids both went to public schools. So they went to a very small public school up here at Pete's Ridge. And then one went to Gosford High and one went to Henry Kendall High. Um, they both really thrived in, in the environments that they were in. Um, and it was perfect for, for each of them. They're very different and it just worked really well. Um, I've had experience teaching in Steiner, Narara Valley, Henry Kendall, Asquith Girls, but I'm now at Central Coast Sports College and I've been there for six years. Um, it's a smallish independent school up just up at Carrion, so it's actually quite close. Um, and a lot of Narara people don't know about it um, or else they think it's full of elite sports people. It's not. Um, the aim isn't for elite sports people. The aim is to um, develop kids' abilities um, to do whatever they want to do to the best they can 
be, to be the best they can be. So in the uh, younger years, they do Walker Learning, which is a play-based program. Um, so that's K to six. Um, and then in seven and eight, they do a bit of a transition thing. And then the most exciting um, thing for me is in nine to 12, they do a big picture program now. I'm actually um, a high school English teacher and I'm taking the last traditional high school ATAR group through. But um, the, I don't want to go on too much because I know we're running out of time, but the big picture <laughs> program um, still allows people to go to uni, but it is very much an independent learning program. So each student has one advisor, one advisor have 20 students. They basically work on whatever they want to work on. They have a couple of days of internship with an actual workplace. Um, we've had people doing things from like all the trades, plus physios, medical, There's, we've got about five wanting to get into medical kind of degrees at uni. Um, about 19 unis now accept big picture portfolios as an, a way to get into university. But it's not necessarily, big picture is not aimed at just getting kids to be highly skilled academically and to be able to get into uni. It sort of covers whatever they want to whatever they want to do. And I've seen some amazing presentations. They have to do exhibitions every term, absolutely amazing stuff. Um, the sports program is two hours a day for every student in the younger years. And it can vary. Um, they do like multi-sports, so they get lots of different sports. And it's basically for those kids that can't keep still in the classroom. Um, and so they get to try all sorts of different sports um, in high school. It can be more specialised, so football, rugby league, tennis, netball, or um, like multi-sport kind of thing. We are now attracting, well, it's only been going for about eight years, so it's taken a long time to get um, exactly what we need to be doing going. So um, we are getting a lot of kids that aren't so sporty now, a lot more. I'm not at all sporty. I knew nothing about football till I went to school. I mean nothing, like I'm a dancer, my kids are dancers. Mm. <laughs> um, <laughs> But um, yeah, so we're getting a lot of kids from sort of homeschooling, Steiner, kids that felt that they needed to, to move somewhere else or just try something different. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, so far it's going quite well. It, it is all very new. Um, there's a lot of years that are full now. Unfortunately, we, we're actually at the old Mount Penang site. So we're in all the, the old boys' home buildings up there. And there's very little room for us to expand or very little ways we can expand because there's all these rules and regulations. Um, but they do do tours. And if you go onto the website, it gives you like all the information. So Central Coast Sports College website. Um, and you can book a tour and they'll take you around and show you everything you want to know, really. It's, it's really good. So, yeah. And there's a cafe and run by chefs every day the kids get free lunch it's amazing food like i don't often have a main meal at night because it's these beautiful salads and amazing food so it's a, a really good advantage they cater for all special diets and everything they're really really good and that's all part of the part of the school so that's yeah fantastic lorraine uh, no talking about it just you know contacts whatever it's fine Thank you. That could tick a box for me because that was one of the reasons we chose to homeschool because I just couldn't bear the thought of packing boxes. I could, I could bear my kids just, <laughs> just for not having to pack a lunch. <laughs> well, we are running tight on time, guys. So what we might do, um, I might just throw to um, our three families, Devon, Dan, Rani and Steph, for maybe a parting comment to anyone who might be considering the Eco Village and um, their children's education as a wider thing, particularly, I guess, if they're looking at moving mid, mid schooling year or mid, you know, uh, schooling experience. So, uh, Rani, any parting words? Uh, definitely, because I think we possibly have really missed out on the um, one of the, the biggest education um, pluses of Narara Eco Village, and that is day-to-day -day life at the village itself. Um, we have a wonderful intergenerational, to use the you know term, of, of people who are really interested in connecting with our children. So we have... Um, in the past rented a grandma for grandparents day um, because our real grandparents were too far away and um, we've got sort of 
um, whether their own grandchildren are too far away or they're happy to be sort of surrogate aunts and uncles, people who are really keen to help give our children other experiences. So whether they're just down in the potting shed helping them um, learn about plants or they're, you know, fixing bicycles, um, there are, or, you know, sort of teaching them about things in the coffee cart or, or doing arts and crafts with them. There is a, a whole different world of education, which we have a, a lot more control on as parents because um, we're right there um, choosing who our, who our neighbours are and who are the people that our kids are interacting with after those school hours. And that's, you know, really powerful as well. Mm. Thank you. That, that in itself is a whole other topic, I think, but I am getting a bit sleepy. So I'm going to cut to Dev and Dan. Thank you, Rani. Yeah, I love what Rani said. Um, I guess, uh, and just to reflect on what's been said before, we, we moved up from North Parramatta and there was plenty of schools around us, but I didn't really feel I had the choice that we have here. So the, the decision for us was not easy between Stein and Niagara Park and, and Montessori. So yeah, as people have said, it's, it makes for a tough decision, but that's a good thing. Mm. Yeah. And I think uh, factoring the village really, like Rani alluded to it, there's also the big backyard that we have, you know, uh, like with Montessori, we knew it was quite a structured, it was quite structured with every day that kids plan at nine o'clock that day. But then we knew there's a big backyard and lots for free play and um, self directed play. And with technology, you know, even we have um, some dads and, and the families here are really interested in coding, for example. So we have the holidays program here running at the moment, which is fabulous. Four weeks of today was circus. Last week was rock climbing. There was something around coding. There's like so many things, even the holidays sort of people. It's really like a learning village. And actually the director of the Montessori School, he knows this village here. He's um, good friends with some of the people here. And he sees the village in some place as a model of a, like a learning village where there's just you know, learning opportunities that pop up left, right and center, whether it's the woodworking with Rob or with that and other things. So I think with the school decisions, just factoring also the, 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 the spirit of the village in as well and how this sort of complements each other, the, the after school and weekends and holidays. Um, and then, yeah, if you, if you want to come in uh, midterm, uh, as I said, Montessori is small, but there is, what I understand, there's a bit of, uh, they have a few uh, spaces for next year. Um, the director knows the village, but I'm happy to make any connections if people want to do an observation or, or just meet or, and see the school. I'm happy to make any connections there for sure. Great. Thanks, guys. Steph, any parting words for people who are thinking of making the shift? Mm. Um, two things came to mind. Um, one, one specifically in relation to the Steiner School is that while it's, it's often tight to get your child in there, um, there, there is a transition of, of students all the time. Every year in Jasper's class, that one or two students will need to leave or move away. Or so there is always new students coming in all the time. So don't be afraid to get in touch with the school. And um, I think we're developing quite a strong relationship, the Eco Village, with the school. Um, so I think they try and help us out as much as they can to to accommodate our our students. Um, but one of the main things that's kept coming across as I was hearing everyone speak is that we have so many fantastic schools, but it comes down, your choice really comes down to your, chil your child and your children and what would make the best fit for your child. And, you know, in Sarah's case, it seemed to me there was, you know, different schools fit different children. And I think that might be the case here. And so um, don't be afraid to check them all out and just go with your gut feeling as to what feels right for your child. Hmm. Thank you. Lots to think about tonight. Um, usually we just clock off with the Zoom, but I, I get the feeling that there are a couple of people want to just have a quick chat. So if you, um, if you do want to stay for a second and have a chat, feel free to. If you want to go to sleep, uh, I, res I respect that choice too. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, everyone, for coming, and particularly to those that have shared their family experiences, because that's not always easy. And until, uh, until next time, see you in a fortnight.